All right, welcome everyone to our Java Programming Inheritance webinar, where we're going to be going over inheritance and specifically what that looks like in Java. And this is an important topic on the AP Computer Science A, which is, you know, the typical course a lot of people teach with Java. I'm going to send this classroom URL to the people participating in the webinar live. Um, at this URL, I think each person that's participating has a familiarity with um, Coding Room's live classroom. But just so everyone's aware, you can go to that URL. My suggestion would be to have the presentation and my workspace open so that you can mess around with the code on your own in your own workspace while you're kind of following along with what I'm doing and you can copy and paste even things from what I'm doing from the presentation workspace. So you can have both those tabs open. So again, what we're covering today specifically is inheritance. And so what really is inheritance is an important question for us to kind of cover for this recording and webinar first. And so inheritance is this mechanism, specifically in Java we'll be looking at, that allows an object to acquire properties and behaviors or you know, instance variables and methods from another object or from another class. And it has this parent-child relationship so that it can inherit, one class can inherit those behaviors and properties. And so this is a, a form of abstraction or modularity and it allows us to what I'm hope, hopefully showing this, and the important thing that I think to my students, is it promotes code reusability. And instead of recreating the wheel each time and us having the same instance variables and in multiple objects that do similar things, we can group them together and we can leverage inheritance to reduce that redundancy of these tasks. And so inheritance, what we'll see, has this is a relationship. We can have a parent class or object, and we can have its children, and the children is a form of that parent. And then, so that's kind of what we'll be talking about in a minute. So to start off, um, what I'm gonna review is an example that I think, so I will say that what you're gonna see today, my students will have a little bit of a background with inheritance of a couple lessons where we've just gone through checking out a couple things. And then I feel like this lesson right here this example we're going to run through together is the one that really cements the idea for them. So they, you know, at this point, they do kind of understand um, the extends keyword. They know that, okay, you know, I, th there's this thing that allows uh, one class to inherit the instance variables and the methods from this other one, but now they're really seeing how it kind of can work together. So what we start off with is this cat class. So if you navigate over, if you want to check this out on your own, we have this cat class. All right. And so we can create a cat object. And what we care about right now is that the cat has a color and the cat has a, um, a sound that it can make. All right. And we say, okay, if uh, we have a default constructor here, if uh, someone wants to instantiate a cat and they don't provide it with any information, we'll just say it's colors unknown and we know that a cat does meow. And then, you know, we have the constructor, if they provide one string, it will be for the color. If they provide two strings, it's color and then the sound. And so you can provide that information. We have some getter methods here to, to get color and sound. And then here are the two main uh, kind of important methods that we'll be messing around with and will be important to to our inheritance kind of lesson is we have this speak method. It's a void method that just prints out um, the blank for the color cat goes blank, blank, the sound. So for instance, if they did a default one, it'd say the unknown cat goes meow, meow. And then we can also, because I really like to, whenever I do things, I always like to include the two string method so students don't forget about two string. So I continue to do that throughout the year as soon as we learn how to create objects. So we have a two string here. So we can print the object also, and it will say this blank, whatever the color is, color animal makes a blank sound. Okay. So we have a cat. 
So over in the main, pre-set up. And so th these are the two things I have pre-set up for students when we start this lesson too. We have a cat object. And then over in the main, I go, okay, you know, we want to test this cat out. So, um, you know, we, we instantiate a cat, cat one. We call the speak method to check out how that works. And we print out the cat. And then actually the second cat, I did a mistake here. Um, let's, let's try out one of the um, other constructors. So let's give it a color and call speak and then print it out and check out what this looks like. So they go, they run this. Everything is good. The unknown cat goes meow meow. This unknown color animal makes a meow sound. The orange cat goes meow meow. And this orange color animal makes a meow sound. All right, so we have that working. So now what I say to them is I go, okay, I want to kind of create a farm or you say like, you know, I, I wanna create a pet shop or something like that. So we're, in order to do this, we're gonna need other animals. So what we can do is a couple things, right? Oh, we can go over and um, let's say I have a dog next. Dog's usually a nice logical one to go next. I have dog.java. We can go and we can create a, our dog. Okay, so we notice in our cat, uh, we create the class, we have, um, you know, these certain fields or these instance variables, and we can go and do it again. So public class dog, and we can go in, we can fill that in, it's going to have private, um, what do we have, string, color, and so on. So we can go over and we can do that for the dog. And they go, okay, I say, say to them, all right, what, what would you do if we need to do this? And typically the students will say, well, we can just, you know, it's going to be the same. We can copy and paste this over here. The, instinctively, if I gave them the task, that's what they would do. And they go, okay, yeah, we can copy and paste uh, most of this. And we can create a dog. Okay. And uh, so we have color. And then they say, okay, um, you know, the constructor is going to change. There's going to be a dog now dog, dog, and they they go woof instead. All right, getters are the same. Speak, oh, instead of a cat goes that, we're going to say dog. All right, and everything else looks pretty good. So we're able to accomplish it pretty quickly, but we got to copy and paste things. So we can go over to the main and for the heck of it, let's test, uh, let's create a dog. Dog, dog one equals new dog. And let's actually give him a color. Um, give him kind of yellow fur. And dog one can speak to. And uh, we can print out dog one too. Ln dog one. All right, so we can run the main. And I didn't put an equal sign there. There we go. And the yellow dog goes woof woof. This yellow color animal makes a woof sound. Perfect. So I say to them, all right, we're going to create the rest of the farm. We have a cow, we have a pig, uh, we have a snake, we got to do that. But I don't want to copy and paste because one of the issues with copying and pasting and, and my students will kind of know this because we've, we've talked about procedural abstraction before um, and modularity um, in the courses that they had prior. But if your students don't have that kind of background, you say to them, I don't want to have to repeat this, these things over and over again. That's kind of the idea of when we started to learn about objects, right? Um, we want to be able to instantiate an object of that thing and we don't have to kind of repeat that code over and over again. So now that we just need to have create different objects, there's a way that we don't have to repeat some of this code over and over again. And you may get a student that says, all right, well, why, Mr. Mazzoni? It was pretty easy to copy and paste this. It's pretty simple. I, and I could say, one of the things I, I talk about is I go, well, what if we made a mistake in this copy and paste? And we go over and we need to change the speak, or we want to just change the speak just for the hell of it. You know, there's something we want to change about it. Now we have to go to every single one or the two string. We go to every single one of these animals after we've copied and pasted that and change it. And what happens when we make a mistake in changing it in one? 
we don't want to have to risk those kind of errors. And as the system that we're building gets larger than even this project here, this becomes more of a pain. And that's why we always want to reduce the amount of redundancy as much as possible. So what can we do? Well, we have to kind of think of abstraction. What is more abstract than a cat and a dog? And instinctively, they may see, especially if you have this already, animal. An animal is a more abstract term to describe a cat and a dog. So what we want to do is we want to make a more abstract version of these things, the cat and the dog. We want to make an animal class first. And they may not know, they may not know fully where we're going. Again, I like to, before I do this one, they kind of had an idea. They go, oh yeah, that thing you were teaching us where we can extend a class, right? And we have this inheritance thing. Yeah, that's, that's right. So we can go over and we can get an animal. And so let's say I'm going to, you know, you can, you can lesson wise, do it however you want, type out each thing and recreate the animal for us specifically. And I would actually show my class this. I'm gonna copy and paste our original cat. I'm gonna put it over an animal and let's, let's make the modifications. What do we need to change about the cat to make it more abstract, to let it work for any animal? Well, first off, we gotta go in and we gotta change the class name to animal, of course. Every animal is going to have a color and a sound. And you can think of other creative things if you like this lesson, some other things that are you know, similar to animals and stuff. I usually do this because the more you add, the more you got to do. Um, now, the constructor, for when we want to construct an animal, the default constructor, you know, every animal doesn't meow. So I'm just going to do unknown. So if we create an animal and we don't provide it with any information about color or sound, we don't know. So it has an unknown color and an unknown sound. Same thing over here. We provide it with a single string. That's going to be for the color. So we can set its color. But the sound, we're not going to know. It's not going to be meow. So unknown. All right. And then uh, we can just change this one. If they provide two strings, then they're setting the color and the sound. And we have that. Perfect, we have a getter for the color, we have a getter for the sound. We can come down here now and um, we can change this. And maybe we wanna say for speak, we want it to be a little bit different. Um, you know, may maybe, maybe we want the speak to look different for this and we say something like, um, you know, not sure what this, Um, this particular color, um, color animal is, but uh, it makes a, uh, and we'll use the instance um, variable for uh, sound. Um, and we'll actually say sound. So if they use the animal constructor or they have an animal object and they use the speak method, it will say, not sure what this um, blank color animal is, but it makes a blank sound because maybe it's a little more unknown. And then the two string we can leave, we'll leave like that. This blank color animal makes a blank sound. Or we could I guess we could say too, this color animal goes blank or something like that, blank, blank for the sound. All right, so we have this. Now, I defined this information in one spot. I have these instance variables of color and sound. I have these methods, get color, get sound, speak, and the two string. How can I leverage that for all these other animals. Well, first let's look at the cat. Okay, and for the cat, what can we do? 
Well, we can, of course, use the um, constructor. We can change that. We have constructors, we have getters, we have speak and two strings. So um, we can almost start fresh with the cat. And that's actually what I tell the students to do. Let's just start fresh with the cat. And what we can do here now is the way that the cat can inherit the information from animal, the instance variables, and the methods is by us using that extends keyword. So we want to extend animal. And what that means is we're saying, hey, the cat now can do all the things an animal can do. The cat is a animal. Right? So, okay, they go, all right, well, you know, let's uh let's run this then. You know, does anything change about this cat? What it can do? Okay. We give it this one thing. It says we tried to construct a cat, but there is no um there's no cat constructor. All right. So now we talk about well what we need is we, we need to set the constructor still. We need to tell it how it's going to work. All right, public cat. And let's do a default constructor first. What do we want to do with that? And they go, well, Mr. Mazone, do you have to, you know, how, how come we can't leverage the constructors we created with the animal? I go, wait, we can. And this is where we introduce the super keyword. And so super allows us to call on any of the methods from the parent class or the um, super class. So sometimes we call, you know, we call it the uh, super class or the base class or the parent class. Tend to, for CSA, I, I like to call it the super class or the parent class. Um, and so from that parent animal, we can use those constructors. All right, so we can say super, and then um, we can use any of those con constructors. So if I just say super here, like that, it will be able to construct the cat, um, and it will give it unknown and unknown. But we don't want to construct a cat that way because we know something about the cat, all right? We know that the cat goes meow. So it may be better for us to say, whenever we construct a cat, a default cat, we're going to say it's an unknown color and it does meow. And that's kind of what we started off with. We started off with whenever we constructed a cat, it was an unknown color and it, we knew it made the sound meow. Now, this isn't going to help us with cat two. And actually, some students may be smart enough to say, well, how come cat one didn't throw an error? And so then you can talk to them about, and I don't get into too much detail about it, is that Java does support the default constructor there. So it does automatically inherit the default constructor. You don't have to do that. The reason why in this cat one, and I always like to be deliberate about what I want these classes to do. So I like to, even though Java is going to take care of that default one for me, if I wanted to keep it using the default from animal, I want to be very specific about what I want the cat to do. For instance, here, when I create a default cat, I want to set its sound to meow because I know cat does meow. So I don't want it to it necessarily just automatically inherit the default constructor from animal. But of course, we do need to provide it with if we if we construct a cat and it's given a string for sound, I'm sorry, for the color. We do want to call the super constructor. So we're going to call animals constructor and we're going to give it the actual color that was provided as a parameter. And we're going to set it as meow. Then the third one was if they provide two strings, 
string um, for color and a string for the sound. And we can call it super constructor. Again, that's the animals constructor. And we can give it the color that's provided by the constructor and the sound. All right, let's, make, let's go over to main now. I can run it. Okay, no problem at all. So now we were able to construct a cat object and it was able to successfully call a speak method and it was successfully able to print the cat. Why was it able to do that? In cat.java, we didn't define those things. Well, it's because we defined them inside of animal. And, and the cat inherits the instance variables and the methods from animal. For instance, there is no color instance variable here on the cat class. There is no sound one. And there, those methods don't exist. But we were still able to um, use them because they're part of the animal. And a cat is a, is a relationship, is an animal. Now, there may be other unique things about a cat, the, the cat one. For instance, let's say the speak method, we want it to be unique from the animal one. Our animal one's kind of generic. It says, not sure what this unknown animal is. Well, we do know what it, that unknown animal is. So if you want the children classes, the child classes, okay, or I, I actually really like the term subclass, all right? So the things that are specifically an animal, the cat, the dog, if you want them to have specific methods, we can override the parents or the superclasses methods. And so we can, we can um, override specifically here the speak method, which was a void method, public void speak. Okay, and um, it was a print statement and I'm just gonna do a copy paste here for the sake of time. Actually, I'm not, let's, let's do this. Let's go over to animal and um, I'm gonna grab this print for speak and I'm just, just so I can modify it. So all right, we wanna modify this specifically for the cat. And um, instead of not sure what, you know, this particular animal is, we'll say the blank color cat, because we know it's a cat, goes, and we'll say the sound and a space, and we'll say the sound again, this sound. And for the hell of it, we'll put an exclamation point at the end. All right, so now whenever we call speak and it's a cat specifically, it's a cat object, it will say the blank color cat goes, and it, let's say it's meow, meow, meow. All right, so I like to do this so everyone knows there's gonna be an issue here. So I like to do this because it gets the students understanding what's really going on when the cat inherits this instance variables, the methods, the essentially the properties and behaviors of an animal. So I'm gonna go to the main again. We have our cat, so it's gonna to try to call speak. And I get an issue. It says color has a private access in animal. And that's right. As is good practice, we set our access modifiers to private for these instance variables. And they may say, well, Mr. Bazone, I thought when you said we create instance variables, we make them private, it's because we, we don't want other classes to be able to manipulate them. We want you know, our particular methods to be the only thing. We wanna control the manipulation of these instance variables. And we, we would typically just change them within the class. How come that doesn't work when it inherits it? So, well, that's how Java controls that. Only this class can access these particular variables the only part of a particular animal instance. 
if we want to be able to access them in CAT, we would even need to make these public, which we don't want to do because then any other um, class could, could manipulate them, maybe in, in a way we don't want. Or that's why we have getters. If we need to get that information or we need to change that information, create getters and setters, accessors and modifiers. Then it's designed for the way that you want it to be able to change and be able to use that information. So we can just go over to cat and we can just simply say, in the super class, there is a get color method that we can use. What get color does, it's still going to do it for this particular instance. It's still gonna do it for that instance of the cat. It's just allowing us to leverage the code that is part of that superclass, that's part of the parent. And we can do that because cat extends animal. And we can do the same thing for get sound. And we'll do that here too. Uh, super. Now I can run my main and we're back to normal. Everything's working good. The unknown color cat goes meow, meow. This unknown color animal makes a meow sound. But then the one where I constructed it with orange, it says the orange color cat goes meow, meow, etc. So now we've gone, over, we've, we've shown the student how to set up the constructors for, for a child class that leverages what you've done already in the animal or the, the parent class. And we've also showed them how they can leverage the getters and even you could do this for setters that were already created in the parent class also. Those are really important skills for them to kind of grasp all this. And we showed them that you can override this particular uh, a particular method that belongs to the parent class. So it, it does its own. So now since we constructed a cat, it uses the cat's speak method. Now, some of you may be thinking, hey, I thought, um, you know, you usually put, when you go to override a method, you put override at sign override um, above that to actually override it. And um, yeah, you, that's true. Now. It's not required. Some people, uh, you know, when I talk to some people, they don't realize it's not required to do this. Uh, when, you, when you use this at sign, you say override before method. What it does is the compiler is gonna make sure that you're properly overriding it and you're not just making a new method. So it's gonna check the su super and it will throw um, an issue if you, if you didn't do it right. For instance, if I say um, at override speak and I, and I all of a sudden require speak to have an int called number or something like this. Um, there was no speak with it with an int parameter inside of the uh, super. I, I'm not even sure if this is going to throw an error properly, but let's check it out. Ah, here it is. So notice when I went to compile this code now, it tells me, hey, you want to override something, yet this method header wouldn't override anything from the super class. Without this code, Without that override, it's now just going to give me an error that I'm using speak. Um, it doesn't even say I'm using speak incorrectly because it just uses, notice it uses the super speak. So now it's saying, uh, not sure what this unknown color animal is, but it's meow meow. So it inherited that speak without this. So this can be a confusing thing, especially for a student that goes, I overrided speak, but it's not using the speak from cat, it's using the speak from animal. What's going on here? Well, that's why it's good practice to use this override because now the compiler is gonna understand if you properly, or it's gonna report to you if you properly overrided the method or not. And so I show students that and they go, oh yeah, that is good. Saying, hey, you, you're claiming to, that this overrides something, but it doesn't. If the method header matches with the super, now it's properly overriding.
Now, another thing that um, I like, what I like to do next, even before kind of building these other animals, and I'm just gonna, um, and even with the students, I just, I, I, we build like one more, we'll build the dog out, make sure it works. And then I kind of copy and paste in some code for the other animals. And that's what I'm gonna do in a minute for, with us. But before that, I actually like to go one step further with a cat here. As I say to them, well, what's great about inheritance here too is there are still unique things all right, um, descriptors or properties of these individual animals. A cat may have something very specific that these other animals aren't going to have. And it's okay and completely acceptable that you may define new fields or instance variables for this particular object, for the cat itself. So for instance, we could say, you know, we want to know maybe if a cat is declawed or not, you know, if it has its claws. And so we could say something like, um, private boolean has claws and you know then we know if a cat has claws or not and that's specific that's a specific property of a cat these other animals we don't care if they have claws or not but the cat we want to know if it has claws and then let's say um now we may we, we may need to modify right the constructors because now when we construct a cat we want to know if it has claws or not. So the default constructor we can we can set it to uh, that it has claws. Naturally, a cat has claws. So if you don't specify if it doesn't, we're going to assume it has claws. So we call the super still, but now we need to set the specific instance variable. We need to give it an initial value. So we'll say this has claws equals true. And we can do the same thing, um, you know, with uh, if they just set the color, we're going to do the same thing. And if they just give us a color and a, um, a sound, same thing. Now, technically speaking, we should probably have some other constructors. And so I'll, I'll do that for just one. For instance, if they only provide us with a Boolean value for the constructor, we probably want to have an option like that, where they're just identifying if it has clause or not. So Boolean has clause. Uh, if they provide us with if it has clause or not, we want to set the um, instance variable has clause equal to whatever Boolean is provided there. So if they say has clause is false, we want to set it to false. And then of course, and I'm just going to copy and paste it over here from my notes. We probably want to have a constructor like this that actually asks for the color, the sound, and if it has clause. Um, and actually I messed this up here because we want this not to be meow. We want it to be the sound that they provide. So even my notes were wrong here. And it has clause. And then um, I'm going to copy and paste in um, this method um, just for us to look at. But I say to the, the students, OK, what's something maybe only the cat will do? And sometimes I've taught this lesson um, where I ask the students to come up with something, we build it. We just say, what's a method that only a cat will do? What's an action that only a cat will do? And um, we'll, uh, you know, we'll build that on the fly. The one I did this year was I just said to them, all right, well, a cat can scratch something. So that's going to be specific to a cat. So we can create methods that are specific to this cat also that only the cat will have. And um, so we end up building something like this, or I actually challenge them to, if you break this up across a couple of days, challenge them to build a, build a scratch method that takes in the number of times you want the cat to scratch. So then the good practice with a loop too and stuff like that. You know, I challenge them to have a loop. So here's, here's that method. Now they can go over if they want into the main and they can also um, use the scratch method. And what I review here also is I, I stop and after we make these instance variables that are specific to the cat and uh, the method that's specific to the cat, I talk about the has a relationship that is mentioned a lot too. So what does the cat have that's specific to it. Well, the cat has a has claws field. 
the cat has a scratch method. These are specific to the cat. And let me go over and let's test it with one of the cats. I'll do it with the uh, cat two. Cat two dot scratch. And we'll scratch six times. And let's test if it works. Perfect. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six scratches. All right, so then, like I said, I typically go over and I have them complete a dog in a very similar sense. What I'm going to do now for us, because there's one more important thing that I want to do with us together on this webinar, is um, so I have them usually complete one more and then I go and paste the others in. So I'm going to go and I'm going to paste in the dog. So let's complete that. And so now dog extends animal, we construct a dog and we set up the override for the dog to speak. It's specific thing. It's specific a uh, speak method. Let's go over to, I have one for cow. Let's open cow. And again, the cow is gonna extend animal. All right, so cow is a animal. And we set up its constructors and we set up and it just uses the super for the constructors. We just give it moo for the cow, same as the dog was woof. Uh, and, we, and we override the speak method. So it's specific for the cow. And we can go over same thing. We've got pig. And then I'll go over and we got a snake. So now we have these animals. Of course, we want to be able to test these. So you can go through and you can construct each of them. So I'm going to go over to main, right? And so we can test each of these animals. We can construct them. So I'm going to go over and so let's say we want to create a cat, a cow, a dog, a pig, a snake. I just copied and pasted. I create an instance of each of those. And of course, you could, um, you know, you have your students go and uh, they can print out each one. They can call the speak method for each one, do those type of things. But what I like to cover now is I like to say to them, well, here's another way that we can leverage this inheritance idea is since cat, cow, dog, pig, and snake are each an animal, each one of them is an animal object. If I wanna store each of these things in an array, I wanna do something like this. I wanna say for, I want to use a for loop because I don't want to test out and, and print each of these and call the speak method for each of them separately. I want to test these, but with a for loop. I want to say for every animal, we'll call it A, in let's create a variable called farm. Let's actually create a farm. Okay. And I want to be able to just say A dot speak. And I want to print out um, each animal. Okay, and uh, I'll just put some white space in there so it separates each one. All right, I want to do that for each animal to test them. How can I put each animal in an array? Well, I, I just, I gave us a hint here. Well, every single one of these objects is an animal. I can't say create an array of cats, right? I can't say cat array for farm because not every single one of these are cats. I can't say dog array because not each one of these objects are dogs. Each one of these objects are 
an animal. Each one of them is an uh, animal. So I can create an animal array and the animal array can store each one of these types of objects. So I can store the cat in an animal array. I can store the cow in the animal array. I can store the dog, the pig, and the snake. I can store instances of each of those because they are a type of animal. So now when I run this code, notice I was able to actually properly test each one. Let me just for just for the sake of the run here, let's just look at that. And notice the cat. I print out the dog, the cow, the dog, the pig, the snake. I was able to iterate over this array. It's an array of animals. I was able to store each of these type of animals in that array because each of them is an animal. And that's one of the powerful things with inheritance. Is that each of these things are an animal, so I can use the animal data type to store them. If I didn't do that, and let's say I individually created each of these like we were planning on doing in the beginning when we started this lesson, I would not be able to store them all in an array because they would each have their own data type. They would have a cat data type, a dog data type. Because I have this generic data type of animal, I'm able to actually create an animal array and store each of them, which allows me to iterate over them. And obviously, if we were to continue this and make all kinds of other crazy things with these data types, each of these classes, we could um, you know, leverage that even more. But for me, for testing each of the speaks and stuff like that, or making our little farm song or something like that, it was a lot easier, a lot less lines of code. Now, of course, if I tried something like a.scratch, right? That was something specific to the cat. A cat has a scratch method. I'm going to get an error. I would need to do that separate for a cat. I would have to, you know, I can I can maybe use instance of and, and check to make sure it's an instance of a cat. Or down here we can say cat dot scratch and just call it after. Um, something like that. But we can't call that on each individual one here because not all of those in the array are a cat. So we can't do that. So that's something cool that you can play around with too and show students. The next step after this is I have another lesson where I give the students the code for all this and we talk about subclasses of, the, of these other objects. For instance, I say, all right, can we get more specific when it comes to a dog? Dog is usually the easy one here. And they go, yeah, all right, what, what, is, what are some specific types of dogs that maybe are, have some different properties of them about them? Oh, uh, a chihuahua is different from a golden retriever, which is different from a pug. So we could create classes for each of those and they could inherit the dog. And when they inherit the dog, they not only inherit the specific instance variables of an animal, but all of the things, aspects of a dog also. And so you can talk about that type of uh, inheritance hierarchy and start show some examples of that. I don't get too deep into that because it uh, isn't need to, but I show them an example of it so they understand that, that hierarchy. The other thing I show them is for constructors. Um, so after I show them this array of animals, I say, well, what if, so that data type can hold that stuff. Um, you can do something like have an animal data type of cat and, and construct a cat. So if I run this, everything's good. Other than and when I get to the scratch here, because the animal data type does not have scratch. So it's trying to say, it's saying cat is a data type of animal and animal doesn't have scratch. However, it, animal does have speak and, and, um, and we can, it does have a two string.
And so it's able to actually um, do th those things. The other thing to notice and students start to point out is, hey, well, each of these actually are using the two, the um, speak method from the, from the proper one though. How come we can't do scratch? So you show them some of the limitations and the ways that you'd have to implement things. Some other good examples um, that I've done is, and, and I, I see this in a lot of curriculums, is the vehicle, right? So you create a vehicle and then the subclasses or the, ch the child classes of the vehicle is like a motorcycle, a bicycle, a car, a truck. One that I like to do that's more of a, so this is like a visual actual objects, animals and stuff like that. Something that I like to do that is more of a data thing is um, I talk about like an, um, an employee, like a system, a computer system that stores information about employees. I said, we create an employee. Then we have different types of employees. There's the supervisors and they, they have certain information we have to store about them and the managers, a regular cashier, something like that. So there's different levels of employees that may look different. Uh, I've done things with uh, Pokemon, which is actually for the gamers out there. Um, some students really like that because it's a you need this type of abstraction in order to create games like Pokemon. So there's a generic Pokemon. All Pokemon have these certain things about them. Then you have, um, can they recast the animal as a cat? Yes, they should. You can you can do that. Um, so there are some good things like that. School is definitely a good one also um, with the admin teachers, students. So in a, in a school, um, you have these different roles. Um, but the game ones, so, some students really do that. Like I do a Mario example. And I say, All right, Mario has different enemies, right? So we create, because this is important for game development. We create a generic enemy data type. And then we specifically have things. So each enemy is able to harm Mario in the same way. Then we can specifically identify what is specific about a Goomba versus a Koopa Trooper or a Paratrooper or the little piranha plant type of thing and the little, the little um, shelled spiky guys, all those things. You can define them very specifically. And I, I've had a lot of students that are into gaming kind of can really make that connection of like, oh, that's how you make these larger games is this helps you not have to repeat yourself so many times. So to end this, before I open up for any questions, is uh, I just wanted to show what are some things you can do to auto grade something like this. So a lot of people have been asking, you know, when they get to more complex things like inheritance, they want to understand how to set up some auto grading with JUnit. So since these all printed something, they were void methods or they were two string, um, I'm going to provide in the chat um, from my website just in case anybody that's on doesn't have it, uh, testing two string and void methods. So you can see the setup because there's a little bit of setup here. We did have a recent webinar on testing void methods or you're doing unit testing. It was getting started with unit testing and I went over void methods. So if you want a deeper understanding of what's going on here, you can do that. But essentially you got to be able to capture the output. Um, so I have that set up. And then what I have is I have different tests to test the two string, to test the um, speak method, the scratch method. And so this is, this specifically I'm testing a cat. So what do I do for these? Well, think exactly what you would do to test it if you were just running the student's code, maybe in a main method. I construct a cat. Notice I use the animal here as the data type. Why do I do that? Well, I want to make sure that they actually use the extend and they actually inherit the animal. So this is, a, this is one way for me to do that. It will throw an error if they didn't set up the cat to inherit animal. So I do that here. I print it to test the two string and then whatever information I want, I'll set as a variable answer. And then the output that actually happens, I capture with this output stream captor. What I like to do is 
just because I, I don't feel like dealing with the little discrepancies of a kid put extra spaces or capital letters. I always, other than if I do want them to be specific, just convert what I expect the answer to be and I get rid of all the spaces and the same thing for their output. I convert it to all lowercase. I trim off any new lines and stuff like that on the end and I replace all the spaces with nothing. So I get rid of the spaces so I don't worry about any of that. And then I compare them with an assert equals. I compare their an the answer to what their output was. This is what I expect. This is what it actually was. What I also do is I put a print statement. You can either attach a message before this assertion, or you can do a print statement before it. And if, if this test fails, the student will see this information printed. So I say something like, checking to see if the cat class's default constructor and two string method work. Cat should inherit two string from animal. So I tell them that. So they have a clue for if it fails, some spots to look. Did I make sure that the cat inherits two string from animal? And oh, he's testing the default constructor with the two string. Did I do that correctly? And then of course you wanna test it with a constructor uh, giving a string and so on. You can set up each test case how you want. So you just set up as many test cases as you want. The uh, convention is to always put the word test before the method that does the testing. You should, and actually I didn't do this here, you should also do at test for any of the test methods that you have in here. So you can do as many of them. Speak, I do the same thing, I construct a cat, call the speak method, set up what I think, this, what should output. So the expected result, and I compare it to the actual output. Again, you should put like a print statement or some kind of message for if it fails, so the student is aware. Checking to see if the cat class class's speak method works, it should override the animals. And so I construct the cat, run the speak method, and ensure that it equals what, um, what I expect. Same thing, I created that scratch method. So here I, I run the scratch method four times. It should print scratch four times if they did it correctly. And I tell them that, hey, I'm testing the scratch method with an argu with a four as the argument. It should, uh, should scratch four times. So it should say scratch four times, something like that. So you give them these hints. Now, a couple things that some people get hung up on with these this auto grading in the unit testing is when should you do multiple tests inside of one test case, right? Because we built one uh, test here, test case inside of Coding Room's test bench. And when should you create different test cases? Like, you know, uh, unit test, cat object two, we're testing, you know what I mean? Type of thing. Well, really it's up to you. It depends on how you wanna set up the points. For this, what I would do personally is I would give them a certain amount of points for the cat object working correctly. Then I would actually have this one be for the cow object, just the animal working properly, all stuff like that. So I would, you know, it, it all depends on the point structure because each of these test cases you set up can have a certain amount of points that awarded if, if it fails, if it passes or fails. If you want each of these individual things, like the two string works properly to be a certain amount of points, but then you want the speak method to be another amount of points, you put them in different test cases in, co in coding rooms. If you want to just make sure they did everything properly with the cat object, you make one test case for that and you do it. All right, so that's that's all I have. And again, essentially with the auto grading, it's just you instantiate the object and you test what you want to test. If it's a void method, you're going to do um, what, like what I did. You need to set up this output stream captor to kind of capture the output and, and compare and make sure it's it's what you expect. If it's a, a method that has a return type, you simply just assert equals and make sure that given a particular value, it returns the value you'd expect it to return. And I have examples on my website for that also.
All right, thank everyone. Thank you so much for participating. If you have any questions, throw them in the chat or unmute now. You're very welcome, Greg. Thank you. Dina, you're very welcome also. It's great to see you both.